God bless you. Welcome to Monday night Bible study. Um, we have a topic before us tonight, one that I am still researching and looking into. Um, again, wasn't too sure I'd be up tonight so soon. So there's a lot more studies um, to be done in this area. It's very deep and wide, but I think it's also very pertinent for our generation to understand the role um, of programming in all human life. And um, I know my brother Michael for Young Adult Ministries has done some really excellent work on um, specifics in programming and understanding how um, specific programs have been used to help to degenerate a generation, to introduce ideas um, to people. But I want to just uh, take a little step back and help us, especially as we go into a time of fasting, to understand a bit about what I call the metaphysics of fasting, that there are some things about it that are really good for you on a human level and to understand how God gets the most out of you during this time and how he uses the process of starving the flesh um, as a help and an aid for you to draw closer to God and to get things accomplished in your life. So the topic tonight is programming and transformation. And my subtopic here is image making all the time. We will know from the, um, the book of Genesis that this idea about being made in an image, um, being made in a specific likeness, um, this language comes to us very early on in the scriptures. And then we see it resurface at the time of um, Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm bringing that up because we hear about images in between then. But at the time of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, we see this specific drive to get people to worship an image uh, and a compulsion um, by the society and a pressure for people to actually bow down. And we make links of that to the... Um, to the, the mark of the beast and the end times and the pressure that would be applied to people to, to give in, to bow down and to give themselves over to a government led program of worship. Um, and so we, 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 we tie those things together. And so we're in a very important time. And tonight deliberately, I'm gonna be using um, alternative language. I'm not gonna have a ton of church language. I'm gonna deliberately use uh, some phrases and terminologies and examples similar to how Jesus would, I guess, in the parables of, of his day, make references to agricultural life and things that people could relate to. I'm aware that this potential, this study has the potential to go beyond the group. So just stick with me. There's going to be a lot of information. And to be honest, the research is bigger than what I'm presenting tonight. I will allude to some of what I've read. Um, it's not all in, in the presentation, but I just want to bring some things to your attention that hopefully help you when you are speaking to others um, to kind of bring the gospel down to their level and help them to understand what's being done to them. The world is being tricked. Revelation shows us that we have an enemy who goes out to deceive the whole world. Um, in fact, I'll jump there as part of my introduction. Revelation chapter 13 It's not in my slides, but speaking about um, a certain beast that would have been released at the time of the end. And if you look down at around uh, verse, around verse eight, it says, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. So the revelation is very clear about the entirety of the earth being sucked into um, the worship of the beast and his image. Um, I'm going to read a few more verses. Verse 14, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which we had, he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had wound by a sword and did live. So here is this again, this push to worship an image. I mentioned Nebuchadnezzar already. Um, and he had power to give a life unto the image of the beast and that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So we see here this, this um, worship of an image. This is really talking about a society that has been set up to suck people in. 
and it will put you in the minority like it did with Daniel and make you think that, oh, if you don't worship, you know, you're going to have real fire. We're going to we're going to have um, judgment pulled against you. This is the, the pressure of the end times. And so this idea about image of worship continues to go through and the programming that goes into that we're going to look at tonight. Okay, first of all, I want to introduce um, or talk about the concept of brainwashing or indoctrination. These words are used negatively um, most of the time. So when if anybody says, oh, you've been brainwashed, um, you know, they, they're, they're saying you've been fooled. You've allowed someone to take over your logic and sell you an idea that's uh, probably not true. And that the only way you could believe that is if you gave over your brain for someone to wipe old information and just implant new stuff on it. Okay, brainwashing is seen as, as negative. Um, and I put here that this is always used negatively, but these concepts of, of, of brainwashing and indoctrination point to a malleable, moldable nature of the clay vessels known as human beings. The Bible says we were made out of clay. When we think about clay in its um, you know, manipulative form, that it is something that can be shaped into what it wants, what we want it to be. And so this idea of brainwashing and indoctrination is giving a truth away is that people can be um, convinced. Uh, people can be persuaded. People can be tricked. And by all accounts, people can be deceived. In fact, deception is, is one of the things that keeps coming up in the scriptures when it comes to describing the world at the end. We have to really understand that the world, they are victims of deception. As much as we might think, oh, this person is a devil. The Bible speaks about those who are deceivers and those who are being deceived, okay? Not everybody who is deceived understands their deception. You know, they haven't all given themselves over willingly. And I think this, this notion should allow us to have some compassion when praying for people, when witnessing to people, sometimes we can become impatient. And yes, some people are a waste of time in that you know they turn out to be swines before whom you shouldn't cast pearls, but we should exercise a degree of patience, endurance, and um, you know, knowing that what we're trying to do is to save people from deception. So not everybody who is in sin is, a, is in knowingly worshiping the devil or knowingly giving up themselves or knowingly, you know, some people are being initiated into witchcraft and obia. People who go to obia man for help don't know that they're entering covenant that's going to tie them up forever until it gets broken. They don't, they go in there for an answer, but they end up entangled. And so the Bible speaks about the devil as being a deceiver. That means he convinces people of a lie. Okay, now I put here, we don't consider that everything we encounter is a pitch or a suggestion of some programming or, or other that we are being asked to on board. I'm saying we, we don't go through life, a lot of us identifying that's a devil. And I think my wife gets upset with me saying that's a devil or that's a spirit or, you know, that's just a, that's just a demon. And, um, you know, I don't know if anybody else is like that, but I smell stuff and they think, oh, it's just a song or it's just a kid's show. No, no, that's a devil. I can I can smell it. I can see it. I can see how the enemy is trying to leave a, a crumb trail for for our children to be deceived by dropping an idea over here. And um, everything in life is making a pitch to you. you. You know, you leave your house the advertising boards are making a pitch to you. You walk through the supermarket and everything there is trying to sell you something. Um, you go in the workplace and the, you know, the, the company is trying to sell you an idea. They're trying to make you believe um, that you are valuable to them. And yes, maybe you, know, you are valuable to your company. I don't know. But I went through many years thinking that HR was a, was a department to support me until you get into a tribunal situation and you realize all they're there to do is to cover um, the backs of their bosses. I hope there's no HR people on here getting offended tonight. But you know, they make you feel we're, we're happy to have you until something happens where it's about you versus the, the CEO. <laughs> and then you see who they're there for. You know, everybody's making a pitch 
to make you believe what they want you or what they want you to believe. And so let's not go through life thinking um, like the news is just the news. You know, you need to flip the station sometime and look at a different news channel and see what, see what they're saying. There's a reason why they call it news programming, <laughs> right? The news is a decision that's been made about information that they want to give you. They don't have all day to give you all the news. They make a choice about what they want you to hear. I remember switching the, the station one day and I thought, let me just go watch Al Jazeera and some major events happening in the world, major tragedy and disasters in some part of the world about people that we in the West don't really care about. So it hasn't made the top news. Everything is biased. The only thing that's coming at you clean is the word of God. The only thing that's coming at you without an agenda is the word of God. You know, even the gospel CDs, they have an agenda. We've touched this before, but there's, there's a reason why, you know, the artist on the front is made up in a certain way and looks a certain way. There's a reason why they've taken that picture. They want you to be attracted to the artist. The, everything is pitching at you. The preachers that come on TV, they've thought carefully about every element of, of aesthetic. Now, I'm sorry tonight, you know, if you're offended by clothing, because I've just I've just come on in a hoodie, but there are some folks that they're they're trying so hard to make an impression on you that their their clothes are doing it first. You know, the, the screen behind them is telling a story, everybody's pitching. Everything is pitching at you. I want to talk a little bit about the things that the world know about that they don't like to focus on, that gives us an understanding that they understand that life is more than what meets the eye. They love to make us think in what we call scientific materialism. That everything must be able to be proved in the laboratory, seen under a microscope, okay? And as if, as if the metaphysical is something that they don't, they don't dabble in. And we're gonna, we're gonna come more <laughs> into this, but hypnosis, I remember seeing it as a kid on TV um, being used in a humorous way, a man making you know, people believe that they're a dog for five minutes and you just think that they're acting, but this whole hypnosis thing is a real thing. And I studied the, the history of this thing and the world know about it. I've put here, this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica that various research have put forth differing theories of what hypnosis is and how it might be understood, but there is still no general accepted explanatory, explanatory theory for the phenomenon. I mean, they, they practice this thing. They've been doing this thing, getting people to feel no pain in, you know, in having surgeries or to forget about things that are causing them problems. I mean, this is not scientific. This is another form of, of programming. Just some history on it. In April 1829, hypnosis was used in surgery um, as an anesthetic in Paris, France for the first time. The doctor said he wouldn't continue using it, even though it worked, because they would have put him out of his business for being involved in what at the time was called mesmerism. And over time, there were some other researchers and practitioners which gave it the word hypnosis, and it became respected um, as that term. It used to be called mesmerism or animal magnetism. Okay, and we're not going to go into all the history, but I'm just letting you know that human societies are okay with phenomena that they can't explain. Yet they would want to make you feel as if you saying that you have um, salvation, that your life has been changed, as if this is something that they can't wrap their head around. And they would like to suppress all of these types of sciences and arts from the mainstream talk because it will open a door for people to understand that there is more to life and spirituality and being a human being that really meets the eye. Another thing that governments have done in the past, they've employed mediums. It was called uh, psychic warfare in the, the you know, 1960s onwards. Uh, Project Stargate was a US um, program where they, as it says here, between 1972 and 1995, uh, attempted to use uh, mediums, right? To, 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 to detect enemy movements and to detect what's going on. This Senator said, um, you know, it's a, it's a cheap radar system. And the only reason they cancel it is because it wasn't 100%. It wasn't that they didn't have success using psychics. It wasn't that they didn't have any outcomes from it, but because the chances weren't 
as close to 100% as they needed it to be, they shut down that department. But that's a couple of decades there. They've been using mediums and psychics to try and give them information about how to solve uh, problems, crimes, and to understand um, what the enemy was doing at that time, the Soviet Union. Um, there's, there's a lot of this that goes on. People still to this day, as you'll know, and you'll see in the scriptures, they'll go to see psychics. And that's why I love the Bible. The Bible doesn't actually hide the spirit realm that the enemy operates in from us. This, is, this was done from all the way back in Genesis, right the way up. We see um, King Nebuchadnezzar consulting you know, these kings of those days, they wouldn't go to war without having their, their shaman, their seers, their magicians. Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He wanted to kill all of them because they couldn't come up with the answer to his problem. They had answers to problems in days gone by. And don't think that people in these high positions are still not using the same influences and the same powers to try to get results in this day. So they know that there is another realm in, in sociology, and I studied sociology, they have a term called socialization, and this is something that we need to be uh, mindful of and careful of in our time. Oxford Dictionary says, um, it's really the second uh, explanation here, so let's use the second one. The process of learning to behave in a way that is acceptable to society. So society tells you what's acceptable, and because society has said X is acceptable, people are ashamed to practice Y. So the whole idea about who is impacting society, um, where is the, the morality for the world coming from, why this is seen as acceptable or unacceptable. We'll understand therefore the influence of the 10 commandments, we've, we've talked about this before, on the modern world, that the, the concepts that were laid down in scripture have actually shaped a lot of the Western world's approach to law. And so you'll find then that people tend to hide the things that the governments or the societies don't want. I've also talked a little bit before about the Puritans who in their time, you know, because of their stance on holiness in the Victorian times, you never saw people in Victorian times with their, their bodies showing out a door. You always see them in these elaborate dresses, big coverings, these big frilly um, outfits, uh, because at the time the Puritans would have none of it. Puritans, they, they, they hate drunkenness and revelry so much, they got Christmas banned because there was too much drunken and disorderly behavior. At their point in time, their influence on the society was actually shaping the laws of the land and what was deemed to be acceptable. Another explanation more deeply, which is leaning more on the sociological explanations, it says in sociology, socialization is the process of internalizing the norms and ideologies of society, right? So this is a form of programming. Socialization encompasses both learning and teaching and is thus the means by which social and cultural continuity are attained. Socialization is strongly connected to developmental psychology. So this is, this is important when we sit back and look at how our world is degenerating, we can see that the influence of the church on society and its lack thereof indicates how a society declines. We used to talk about it when they took prayer out of the schools and all the rest. We see a decline in, in uh, moral behavior uh, when they stopped reading the Bibles in the school. I was still, even though raised in England, in a school where they would sing hymns in the morning and the school still had some kind of moral code. You now have schools where they're introducing uh, witchcraft, they're introducing um, anti-biblical philosophies around sexuality into the nurseries, into their books. Why are they putting it in the books for the children? It's because they're trying to mold their minds. They are trying to reprogram them so that what society previously called a crime, and in England, you know, they, they had a crime called buggery, which I think a lot of you will understand what that is, but that was the against the homosexual act and you could be arrested for that. It was a crime. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's what the society should go back to, but I'm getting you to understand that when something is a crime, then people do it in hiding. It doesn't mean that people stop doing it. It just means they practice it underground. 
So in that particular society, the prevailing idea was that um, this was not right behavior. The Bible specifically calls it an abomination. The Bible doesn't call everything an abomination. It just says some things, you know, don't please the Lord. Thou shalt not do this. But then when it comes to this sexual act, it says this is an abomination. It's actually put it on a, on a higher level. I know people don't like to talk about levels in sins, but an abomination is an abomination. And so the legal society and framework of the day said, we are going to penalize this as a crime. What they've tried to do over the past 30 years and probably for a longer period of time since the sexual revolution is to introduce ideas of free love. You can love whoever you want to love. You can love as many people as you want to love. And so there was a time where divorce in society was a shame and people wanted to cover up their divorce. People would rather live in separate rooms in one house than to be divorced because the church made divorce a, a dirty word. And what society has done, it's called marriage, a piece of paper. That's all it is, just a piece of paper. You don't need to marry anybody. You don't need to commit to someone forever. What if you don't love them anymore? So society has, has worked very hard at cheapening marriage and undermining the family um, for a long period of time. And they begin to introduce it into literature. The only slide that's missing from here is something on advertising. I did do some research on it, didn't include it. But the power of advertising to influence the minds of young people and children and even adults is evident. It's why companies spend millions on advertising because they understand the power of putting forward image association with an idea that will make you want to purchase their product. It was actually um, Hitler's Germany and his uh, media man, uh, Go Goebbels, who ran such an extensive campaign. Um, they've done so much research into how effective they were. So for, for generations, they were able to raise a whole generation hating Jews. They had in the storybooks for children how much G uh, Jews would steal from them, made it easy for them to um, get to the point where having Jews exterminated um, like rats was an okay idea because they were holding back German people by cramping their economy. Hitler didn't just hate Jews because they were Jews. It was an economic move and it was imprinted um, in, in the children's literature. And then also the anti-Soviet propaganda uh, was just so deep in the society that a whole country eventually stayed silent or was complicit and willfully uh, believing that what Hitler's, Hitler's program was a right program. That was the power of him changing what was normal to that society and, and getting them through a process of giving them information and, and corroborating stories. In fact, I'm not sure if it was him that said it, but one of these men said, all you have to do is say something three times. And if it's a lie, it doesn't matter. After three times, it becomes true. It's why, it's why the, the political leaders, they'll get up and they'll keep saying things. The election was stolen, the election was stolen, the election was stolen. The more you start saying stuff is more people believe, it doesn't have to be true. You just keep saying that. And was it stolen? Time will tell. I don't really have my doubts about that. But that particular president has had a, a track record throughout his entire presidency of just saying things that aren't true, hoping that his message will get across. That can be fact-checked. He, he can be fact-checked from here to kingdom come. He told multiple lies, whether he's God's man and you think he's God's man, the man is a liar. OK, he's a liar. It's proven. It's not it's not nothing, no rocket science about it. But by getting up before people and saying things over and over again, it can almost seem like it's true. OK, and even the proverb says that it says that, you know, the, the first person who speaks sounds true until you hear the cross examination. And until you hear the other witness, anybody can say something and it sounds true. What am I talking about? Socialization. And so in the world that we're in, the enemy has so many vehicles to, to impress upon the minds of young people and even the churches. I'm tired of getting conspiracy theory WhatsApp messages. Now I'm, I'm, I'm tired of seeing like, do your own research. Don't just pass on a video that you haven't looked at, that you haven't fact checked for yourself and stop the scaremongering, stay in the word of God. You know, sometimes we just, we just spread fear uh, because we, we, have not, we have not taken the time to look at what the facts are. And the facts can be difficult to find in a time like this. 
where if you live on this side of the internet, it's only one thing. And if you live on this side, you see something else. I subscribe to both CNN and Fox News because I want to see I want to see the full gamut of information. I've got ABC in the middle and MSNBC, BBC. I, I don't take my information from one place. I try to get an aggregate of information to make up my mind about what is true because everybody has an agenda. If it's not coming from your Bible, you don't have to put your trust in it. I need to say that again. If it's not coming from your word, you don't have to put your trust in it. You don't have to make anybody force you to be a Republican or force you to be a Democrat or force you to be a Black Lives Matter activist or pro-Trump or anti-Trump. Just be pro-God and his word. It's the safest place to be because all of these forces around you are trying to pull you in one direction or the other. When we come on fasting, what are we doing? We're emptying the system. We're saying, Lord, I want to hear from you. I want to know what you have to say. I have been pulled and pressed and influenced by so many voices. Let me hear your voice. Let me become what you want me to become. Yeah, I want to be in a, in a godly environment, a holy environment, holy influences on my life that are going to pull me in a Godward direction. I want to drop this information in again, just to show you, number one, that the, the world, um, the information that's in the world is, is advancing and changing all the time. So what is a fact today can be proved tomorrow or be advanced tomorrow. And um, there's a TED talk by a professor called Lara Boyd. And she speaks about the fact that they used to think that the brain, you know, at a certain age just deteriorates. I think that the prevailing uh, facts used to be that once you reach the age of 30, you just start losing brain cells and there's no hope for you from that point. It just gets worse. But they discovered that the brain actually changes every day through that process they call neuroplasticity. And this is really important because um, the way we preach the gospel sometimes and the way Christianity is put over is almost as if be saved because you will have a better life on earth if you give your life to Jesus. Look what he did to me. When I came to him, you know, I was out of a job. I wasn't married. Now, you know, he put my life together. You have a good job. I have a husband. I have children. Sometimes the way the gospel is preached is in a very materialistic way. And what we don't realize is why some of these churches look really successful is because they are driving the information into people that amounts to a degree of transformation in the flesh. You know, if you start adopting better practices about your work life and your family life, if I start giving you advice about how to balance your life and, and how to get ahead in your job, if I can cultivate in you characteristics that work in the workplace, it can make my church look like it's a successful place because people are on board in the information that I'm pushing across. That's why we always say a lot of church today is a bit like motivational speaking because people pay, they pay money to listen to people who will motivate them about their careers, about having a prosperous life, about receiving more finance. You know, and they, they spend a lot of money on a motivational speaker and they're really good <laughs> in the flesh. You want a better life in the flesh? These guys are very inspirational. When you hear a racks to riches story, when you hear how someone decided to take a course or to just read a book and to apply the words in this book, and now I'm also a millionaire, blah, blah, blah. These things continue and will forever continue to pull people in with varied levels of success. But what's been proven is that because your brain is always changing and can be changed, that can um, uh, bring about changes in your, in your life chances. So some of what she found out is that the brain is actually changed by your activity. It's changed by what you do and it's changed by what you don't do. So the things you don't do for a long time that you used to know how to do, you can forget to do them. Even though you were very capable many years ago, you might be skipping on a rope, it might be you, you know, doing the hula hoop, your brain used to be quite good, right? But you stopped that's doing that, now yeah. you can't do it anymore. Yeah, I'm thinking about that one the yeah. power of this information, let me just mute that person, is that you know practice changes the brain the brain doesn't change practice so if you are able to understand like many of us have done if i if i introduce exercising into my life every morning i'll just do 20 push-ups 
I'll make sure I drink some water and, and eat some vegetables or whatever, alter my diet. Um, after doing that for a while, my brain is now wired to do it. I had to convince it for a period of time that this was the right thing to do. But having forced myself to do it, I now do it naturally. It's just the way habits are formed. Okay, this is not this is not deeply spiritual. This is just something I'm trying to tell you about the potential of your actions and your brain. Put this into a spiritual context. The enemy fights us doing the things that are spiritual. He fights a spiritual routine because he knows if you keep that routine for long enough, your body will want to do it. Right. This is where, where David said, and I believe this is what he meant by it, that my my heart and my flesh are crying out for the living God. My spirit man and my physical man now want you. I'm at the place where everything about me is moving in a Godward direction. I'm hungry for you. I'm thirsty for you. This is one of the, the, the powers of fasting. If you can get the routine of fasting into your life, you can actually get your whole body to agree with the purposes of God. I said it would be a bit metaphysical, but there are things that we can do in the natural that will enhance us in the spirit. Now, the enemy knows this witches knows this and they they practice and practice and practice until they become wholly given over to another spirit how much more you know if we submit ourselves to god living for god begins with a rational decision for most of us not i don't know how many of us were hit with a bolt of lightning like paul but most of us were preached the gospel and we 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 were convinced by the message i need to give my life to god Followed by, I need to stop doing some of the things I used to do. I can't do the things I used to do anymore. Yes, the Spirit of God helped us to make some of those um, actions in our life, but a decision was made. We decided to walk out on the devil. That's what the songwriter said. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. If, if we don't make a conscious decision to walk with God, just like when we walk into a marriage, it's a conscious decision and a choice to love. I don't care how much feelings and romance that you had at the beginning of that relationship. The romance doesn't keep the marriage together. What keeps the marriage together is a vow and a decision to keep that vow in sickness and in health for better or for worse. It's the vow. The vow is important. It's a decision. I would tell young people and it, it deflates their bubble a lot of the time because there's so much in love. But the reality is it's, it's, not, it's not what you feel that keeps your marriage together. It's the choices you make. It's negotiation. Right? How many times have we had to have peace talks in our marriage for the marriage to go forward? It's a decision. It's a decision. So the behaviors that you employ can change your brain. And, and, and when we are molded, when our lives have been brought into a place where we have given ourselves the advantage that now my whole body, everything about me wants God. I've put my, my flesh under subjection right? Now I've got the mastery of my flesh. I'm now free to do major exploits for God. Some of the rest of the research says that, and this was, this was a study that started in stroke victims, because what they wanted to know is how can they get stroke victims working again, walking again, talking again, and, and, and what happens in the brain on the journey of their change? That what they found out is if that if the stroke victim didn't try to walk, it wouldn't be able to walk. If they didn't try to talk, if they weren't making the attempts over and over again. And what they said was that the more struggle you go through in trying to achieve that aim leads to the greater structural changes in the brain. You see why sometimes we have to go through some hard things. You see why sometimes we have to go through difficulties. The Lord understands how we're made up. He knows what a, what a valley experience will do to us. He knows what being brought to the brink of our own existence and, you know, thinking it's all over. He knows. My father always used to say he's a God of brinkmanship. He knows why he needs to bring you to the edge of yourself. Because when you come back from the brink, you are strengthened like never before. You receive the ability to overcome the things. Oh, it doesn't even petrify you anymore. When you get to the situation when you have more money than bills, rather than pulling your hair out, the next time you get there, you say, well, he's done it before. <laughs> You'll do it again. And then you can speak to somebody who's going through it. They come and tell you, I'm going through this trouble. And you say, well, you know what? He did it for me. He can do it for you. You stop stressing out because of what you go through. 
This is how we have been designed and the Lord knows this. We're just finding this out through science. She suggests in her conclusion that you should study how and what you learn best. So this is unfortunate for some of us. I've often prayed to the Lord, if you can, if you can get me to the next level without taking me through hell, I'll, I'll happily take that road. If you, can, if you can promote me without the pain I had to go through the last time, then please let me take that route. Some people, they can hear something and they run with it. Other people, they need to see it visually for them to really understand it. Other people, they have to go through it for it to really sink in. What they're suggesting here is that we have different learning styles. Some of us, we don't, you know, if we look too long on a page, maybe we fall asleep. And maybe the best way for you to read isn't to, to be looking at a book, get, get an audio version. Don't stop because you can't focus and concentrate. Get it in your ears. Find out audio visual, maybe watch it instead. Find out how you, you learn best. Many of our young people have been told their brain not, don't work good. Many of them have been told, you know, you're just not good at maths. And what, we, what it is is that we haven't found out the way to get that message over. We haven't found out the best route to onboard that information. So please don't put your children down and don't uh, pigeonhole them and think that they can't become anything. And don't always let the school define how successful your children can be. Know your children and understand their style of learning. Some of us may have to pull our children out of um, mainstream schooling because of their ways of learning. Some of us may have to make some tough decisions about how we raise our children in the end times. But don't let, don't let no institution tell you your child can't. There's always a way. And just to, to finish the study, it says you should repeat those behaviors that are healthy for your brain. Some of you might, might learn best in the morning. You know, you want to be an early riser, go to bed by 10 o'clock. Go to bed, but don't, you know, you're going to get yourself in a, in a situation of fatigue if you keep, as my dad said, burning the candle at both ends. You know, some of us don't, don't onboard information late at night. So get up and read early in the morning. Go, to, you know what I'm saying? Like work out how. In the Bible, it says in another way, you should work out your own salvation. For us, we really have to work out how we're going to be successful spiritually. I'm grateful that we went through 21 days last year. Um, to onboard new habits and uh, you know people have come back and testified to me it'd be great to hear some of them in the group sometimes but how that period changed them how that period really allowed them to start something new and hold on to it and keep it because the science behind it said if you if you change your actions for 21 days it becomes normal um, and some of for some of you this will be repetition but if you buy a watch today you'll feel it for 21 days after 21 days, you won't feel it anymore because your brain has just accepted that it's there. That's the theories of neuro, neuro um, plasticity. And if you can do this um, and break the habits that are not healthy, this equals progress. I've spent a long time in the natural. I'm going to spend a little bit more before I go all the way to the spiritual. In fact, I think we're here. So understanding the programming of the world and developing counter programs you know as I was talking to my daughter about what we were going to talk about tonight you know we you know we were just saying that you know I've had to put counter programs in my children to send them into a public school we cannot shelter and I don't even think it's wise to completely shelter our children from um, ungodly information or negative theology or negative statements about God like we they're not going to make it in the real world I don't believe if they're incubated from the world for all of their life you know all of their education and then you try and send them into a workplace or then you try and send them into university and all of a sudden everything you try to hide from them is just on a plate I think we have to find a balance between you know sheltering them and and actually onboarding the right information to them that when they go into those environments they already have the antidote right they've been they've been spiritually inoculated or vaccinated against the information that's coming from the school we all have to make these decisions in the end time about how we prepare our children for sex education as it's being taught in the school how do we help them to um approach the, the subject wisely how do we make them as wise as serpents and, and harmless as doves 
How do we make them resist that information yet still be accepting of sinners? You know, how do we get them to state their position without pushing people away from Christ? This is the challenge that they have. And I think the longer we hide stuff from them is the harder we're going to make it for them as they get older. I put here that the Lord has provided us with a program for the human being, the entire person of the human being. That information is the Bible. We talk about the Bible as a manual for human beings. One said uh, uh, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. I like that. This book is preparing us for the afterlife. And so we have all the information that we need. The question is, is really how do we break that down? How do we distill that information both in our lives and in our children that they can really overcome the programming of the world? The Bible takes into account, I put here, the entire human being, body, soul, and spirit. And, and, and the world wants to pretend that they don't know about the spirit realm. They know about the spirit realm. They know so much about it. They don't want it to enter in to mainstream science. I know they know about it because these witches fly around and curse people's houses. I met a witch myself who was saved. Tell me he used to fly into people's houses and curse objects in their house. Tom, I heard that with my own ears. They know there's more to life than just the body. They know it. The studies that I've been reading recently tell me a whole lot more that they know, but they don't want it out there. They have studied people with what they call multiple personalities. They have said that when these people are exhibiting other personalities, that their features change. Some of their features change. Some of them get different eye color. We know this from casting out demons that people's features change when spirits are possessing them. They know it. They said that the person can not only get an eye color, but they can get an eye disorder. So as themselves, they can see, but as this other person, they need glasses. These, they, they, this is in the, 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 the journals of science. They don't want it in the mainstream, but they know. They would say, oh, this is just, this is just personality. If it's just a personality disorder, why are your features changing? I don't know what you see, but I've seen people's features change on me when we're dealing with devils and demons. They know there's a spirit realm out there, but they, they don't want to put it forward because if there's a demonic realm, then there must be a godly realm. If there's a devil, then there must be a God. That's what they don't want that information out there famous phrase from a movie that the greatest trick the devil played was making people believe he didn't exist and they've done that for the longest time in the meantime they've switched their programming around to introduce the character of satan through netflix and all these different shows they've been showing you they're not hiding anymore the whole show is called lucifer <laughs> now they're saying okay come over and let's talk let's talk Let's give you some more information. Let's, let's, let's let you get some compassion for Lucifer. Let's let you see how hard Lucifer had it in heaven. Let's get you having some emotion towards darkness. The Bible deals with body, soul, and spirit. But the educational system of this world wants to mask the spiritual aspect because if it goes too deeply into it, the power of God must become exposed eventually. And it then lends witness to what the Bible has been telling us and what, what we have experienced in the preaching of the gospel. First Thessalonians 5, 23, an example of this, this coverage of the word, that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in Paul's writings, and you'll see it mostly in Paul, that he's acknowledging the three realms of man. There are things happening in your body that are not happening in your spirit. We dealt with this on deliverance ministry. There are things in your body, not in your spirit. We don't like to think of uh, demons possessing people, but we're, we're happy to say sickness is of the devil, but we don't want to believe that's a devil in our body. Things can happen in your body that don't touch your spirit. Spirit of infirmity in the body needs to be cast out. The scriptures deal with this 
and we're not going to go into every aspect in which it does. But I like that Jesus, when he comes and he meets the woman at the well, he says that our cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. It's the issue of worship, church. It's the issue of what you give worth to. And if you have given more worth to Netflix, to social media, to the gym, to any aspect of life, to eating more than to God, then you have detracted worship from the Father. What you give worth to is what you give time to. That's why it's, it's a light thing to give God the first couple of days of the year. It's 365 in the year. And I'm taking out the first, you know, 14, 21, seven days. I'm putting aside food because he's worthy. What's more important than the worship of the father? He says, but those who are going to do it must do it in spirit. So there's an aspect of worship, and we've touched this again before, that the Lord is looking for from the believer, not just observance, not just bringing your body to church, not just bringing your body to Zoom. People must bring their spirit, their emotion, their inner man. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. He said, I'm seeking people to worship me in this way. Of that would say no holy quietness. There's no, there's no holy quietness, church. My emotion must be evoked. How can I go from being spiritual and emotional in church with my hands raised to being at home on Zoom and just rocking? I don't know about you. That won't work for me. That don't work for me. God requires inward expression, right? from the soul of man, from the spirit of man, pouring out to him in worship, in praise. We are not one dimensional people. God wants us to be programmed in the spirit, to, to have a counter program to everything that the world is pushing. I recognize that some folks were raised in holiness church, but they have not onboarded holiness as a program. It's not who they are because they can't smell um, unholiness in other in other items if their preacher didn't tell them they can't sense it they can't smell it and then they become overly um zealous about about foolish things about light things about small matters when the holy spirit is truly onboarded in your life he is the reason why you don't like things that are not holy it is him that turns off that says i don't like this it's the spirit of God withdrawing inside of you. That is your detector of viruses that come into your system. We have to worship him in spirit and truth. The father seeks such to worship him. God is spirit. The real version says he's spirit, not just a spirit. He is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's a requirement. It's a requirement. So there's something that has to happen in the spirit of the believer that makes them more than just a, a, a philosophical Christian. I go to a church Christian. Your spirit must be involved. That means that there's some fight in you. There's some, there's some emotion in you. There, you know, some people say oh, you, get, you get emotional. Why do you get so worked up? Because it's in my spirit. It's not just in my mind or my thoughts. This thing is in me. He said to the same woman, this thing will be a well in you springing up into everlasting life we have water to counter the streams of the enemy and the waters of trouble that flow around about us let's just talk a little bit i'm not going to be long tonight this is instructional teaching and i want to be very practical as we close programming devices so music is one of the things that the enemy uses to program people with messages um, with sounds and, and um, with words connected to rhythm. Music is one of the things he uses. When we're in the world, for most of us, and for some of us, unfortunately, we're still, still fighting with some of this music. But the music has an intention to sexually stimulate you, to arouse you sexually, to tell you stories to music that make you desire relationship that make you desire intercourse. There's a spirit in that music to, to break you down and to draw you away. The music, as we've seen for the past 20, 30 years, filled with violence, engendering a disregard for human life, 
glorifying the life of crime. That's a lot of what hip hop did. And it still makes me sick to the stomach today that some of these guys are held up as heroes when they know what they did. They know the compromises they made with the industry to peddle murderous music, evil music, music that degraded women. They were paid to do it. They got lots of money to do it. And we think just because they are for black lives that they get a pass. We make it look like, oh, they did well because they set up their own brand. No, they poisoned the community for 20 odd years. And now you wanna, you wanna celebrate them now, they're trying to put some money back. They, they poison the minds of people. They open the gateways of the mind of so many young people to think that that was their only way out. They glorify the life of crime. I'm not proud of any of them. Glorifying crime, glorifying a disregard for human life, degrading women. And it's just funny to see how some of the church out there has just tried to embrace all of this as a, 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 you know the, the ends justifies the means. The music is also indoctrinating. Don't, don't get it twisted. A lot of people don't want to listen to preachers because they're getting a lot of doctrine through music. They're getting a lot of teaching about who we are, where we came from, and they would rather listen to the music of this world for their information than to listen to a preacher and a man of God. And then you have some preachers who get right behind these rappers anyway, so they confuse people. Music is used to program. Some of the music we are listen to, even gospel music, we gotta be so careful because they become gateways to other spirits and other music. Why? Because that artist is constantly listening to worldly artists for inspiration. That's why they stole their rhythm track, Ty Tribbett. That's why they stole um, the, the, the bass lines. So you're, you're, you're supposed to be listening to gospel words, but actually you're grooving to a, a rhythm track that was from a worldly song. Mixed up, it's not holy. What fellowship has light with darkness, but those things open up doors for other spirits. We've covered that before. The social media and the gaming also seeks to overstimulate the brain with images and sounds that arouse. They create dependency on alerts for likes and for followers. And you see now people, the first thing they grab in the morning is their phone to see what's happened on social media overnight. It's an addiction. When the alert goes off, they know if it's Facebook, if it's Instagram, if it's, if it's WhatsApp, they can tell the difference between that and an email. It's just, you've been wired. You've allowed your brain to be rewired to a device. And I've shared before some of the statistics on what's happening to young people, their ability to focus, their attention has been reduced. Now, if you can't give them a message in 30 seconds to a minute, you've lost them. That's what these devices have done. The TikToks and all these, these, um, these apps where you've got to get your message over in 30 seconds or in a few words as on Twitter. And it reduces their communication skills as well. It's a shame that, that these kids have had such a strong online presence. And you meet them in person, they can't even make eye contact. It's destroying a generation. They're being programmed and the enemy's giving them a whole load of different messages through this. And we'll, we'll jump onto some of these. Through the movies and the TV, they've been introduced to witchcraft. That's been going on for years. Disney's been doing that for years. I don't know a Disney show without witchcraft in it. I don't know if you can tell me one. They all have a witch, a magician, or something. That's what they live to do, glorify sorcery. Now I see there's this, this openness to aliens. Oh, the aliens, they're our friends. <laughs> we can work with the aliens. They've been sharing their technology with us for years behind the scenes, they say. Demons. So they're, they're opening the mind to young people to be associated with extraterrestrial beings. They are normalizing what I would call the against nature activities in favor of pleasure seeking. Paul said in Timothy that they would be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. He speaks about some activities as being against nature. I like that phrase because you can't argue with it. Nature designed a man to be with a woman for the purpose of procreation. And it's testified throughout all of creation. 
whether it's plants or animals. It's quite clear. So Paul says, a man being with a man and a woman being with a woman is against nature. Now society has tried to socialize us to see that as a lifestyle choice and that your children have a right to choose that life. What I'm finding now as I, as I litmus test my daughter's generation is that most of the young people now will say they're bisexual because they don't want to offend the other sex. They're open to another uh, experience. Can you see where we are now? Because they've socialized young people to think that lifestyle is okay. It's not linked to ill mental health. It's not linked to demonic possession. It's not linked to programming. You see, while it was said that this was linked to mental health, then people would seek help. Now the narratives have, has, has changed. Now we all of a sudden have more instances of people who are openly homosexual or bisexual. Oh, now the great. next generation feel pressured because you showed me a book about Steve and Dave, who was the, the fathers of Rachel in that storybook. Now I have to accept this in my mind that this is a possibility. So, so the next generation are not thinking I'm gay or I'm straight. They're thinking I'm open. This is where that generation is. They now don't want to speak against anything because the word of God is not being preached to the degree where people feel that sin is sin and it's filthy and it's dirty. They've been onboarded viruses. So in all of this, normalizing what I call against nature activities, you see the suspension of reason. So they, they put aside all science and maybe I'll just read something I wrote um, when I was just praying through on this subject. There has been no DNA discovery of a homosexual gene, nothing scientifically to suggest that pedophiles have a genetic predisposition to desire children sexually. We understand in the spirit realm that every human being is like a motherboard or an operating system capable of running programs and capable of being infected. What they have done is they have onboarded programs that open the door to all kinds of filth. What's the church gonna do about that? You can choose which programs you install and which you reject. Exposure to certain doors on the World Wide Web, expose your computer to certain types of viruses or corrupted programs that you receive unwittingly. They can also increase your susceptibility to viruses. We understand this in the natural. If you go onto certain sites that are not legal, you open up your computer to get viruses. I know somebody knows what I'm talking about. You wanna download a movie from a site that isn't legal. You wanna go and watch and stream some sports live from a site that isn't legal. You open up your computer to get viruses. Well, this is, this is what's happened in the spirit of mankind. In the process of seeking pleasure, they've been infected. In the process of going after their own desires, they've been infected. And now it's like normal to have the infection. And this infection is not an infection. I chose this infection. I chose this disease. This is where we are in the spirit. The education systems of the world um, are also set up, as we have said earlier, to program our children, and we have to be careful. Let me go back to what I was, re was reading. When you allow transgender people to read books to your children, you expose them to a virus and you increase their vulnerability. When you put stories in a book full of social constructs that reject science, you increase their vulnerability to viruses. When you try to make it look that unnatural things are natural, you make them vulnerable to a virus. These systems of hypnosis and what they call neuro-linguistic programming let us know that humans know that other humans can be programmed. And that's what's happening right now officially through the government and the laws of the land. People are being programmed to be against God. This is an anti-Christ agenda we are up against. 
Now, it's going to take courage for us as people of God to stand up against the tide of a system, just how it took Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego courage to stand up one when they were in the minority. The education system I've put here is built upon scientific materialism. And this is a quote. And scientific materialism rests on the belief that everything there is or ever will be springs from the interaction of matter and energy and absolutely nothing else. This expectation is an article of faith. And this man, Joseph um, Selby, is making the claim that science is a religion because you have to take leaps of faith to believe it. Yeah, You have to take leaps of faith to follow um, what science tells you about the world because not all of it can be proven. Their belief, however, is that what we don't understand today at some point will be proven through a scientific materialistic means. And until then, we shall keep trying to discover it. But they know they can't explain hypnosis. They know they can't explain with science demonic possession and split personalities and all these things, but they don't want to um, engage with these things because they know that it will lead to God eventually. Some biblical indicators now for personal transformation, especially as we are in fasting. We're not here for games. We're not here to prove we can fast a certain length of time. Uh, we, we have an objective to be transformed to go from glory to glory, to go from strength to strength, to be able to know that by the time I've come through this fast and get to the middle of 2021, I'm stronger at this point this year than I was last year. I'm not the same person. I've moved on. I've grown spiritually. Romans 12, verse 2, verses we know very well. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? So the Bible, the Lord through his word, calls us to mind renewal. A mind needs renewal. Okay, it's like, as I said, it's that old hard disk. It's got so much information on it that is no use to your salvation and no use to God. And so you need to take that hard drive of your life to the Lord and allow him to cleanse that. The mind has to be renewed and it doesn't get renewed just by wishing it. I'll go back to what it said uh, in, the, in the brain research. It's only gonna change by the actions you take willfully. Willfully putting your mind in the word of God. Willfully asking the Lord to speak to you. Taking the time to hear from him. I don't wanna upset God by talking to him and never stopping to listen to him. I don't want to be, nobody likes a friend like that who just talks all the time and never listens to you. That don't make you feel good. When you have a friend and you know you got some things you wanted to offload and every time you get in their presence, the only thing that matters is their problems. You don't like that kind of friend and God don't like that kind of friend either. He didn't teach us to pray like that. You don't want you to come to him like he's Santa Claus and he's just there to lift all your burdens. You have to talk to him as a friend. What's on your heart, Lord? That's what the, the Lord's prayer is about. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Not my will, the songwriter said, thine be done. Sometimes we want things and we're chasing things and we're not ready for the things that we want. He, his timing is the best timing. The time that you'll be at most peace is when you find out what your purpose is for God and just work on that. All these things he said will be added to you if you don't seek after them. They'll be added to you, the food, the clothes, the shelter, all the stuff for just getting by. He says, I'm your father. I'll take care of that. Don't dwell on those things. Your mind needs to be renewed. Why? Because he said, after these things, the Gentiles seek. That's who we were. We used to think like that. We used to go from one paycheck to the next paycheck. We didn't used to save money so much. Some of us weren't interested in putting no money down for the future. Some of us didn't care about settling down with, with one person. And so we got stuff in us that, that the Gentiles used to go after. We, we, we can't think like that anymore. Sometimes going to church, we're thinking so much about what we're going to wear. We haven't even thought about if we're going to come in with a praise, if we're going to come in with worship, if we're going to come in with a spiritual intention. We've spent so much time on the natural. Remember how stressful it used to be trying to get that Sunday dinner ready. 
or part ready before you leave the house to go to church. I used to resent that. I have sometimes wish a minister read that we keep Sabbath because I, it's one thing I can't take is a madness around cooking before church. My Lord. Who want to go to church smelling of food? Like the, the, the rush. God just, I thank him for just allowing some things to cease for a while so we could gain some perspective on what's really, my mind has to be changed. My mind said, just make sure you make it to church. No, I need to now say, I'm bringing the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. I ain't coming to church to find my praise. I'm bringing it. That means I am preparing myself for church. That means my Amen. service is not dependent upon the choir leader, the song leader, or the preacher. I'm having the best service today because of how I come to church. And no one's going to stop that. That's a different mindset. You need your mind to be renewed. It says, don't be conformed to this. Don't try and match up to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can't look at the world and think you're going to make a good image for God. You become like the things that you focus on and look at. You can see who people are listening to in terms of music sometimes just by the way they dress. Because you become like what you look at. I, I keep getting into conflict with... Um, with uh, my, my daughter over her here, because she's not European. I don't want her to look European. I want her to be happy with the hair God gave her. And I want her to learn every style in the book to style her hair like a black woman. Because I see that as a sign of discontentment, that you will try to style yourself like something you're not. Your mind needs to be transformed. You've been looking at the wrong stuff. You have your mind focused on the wrong images. I don't know if I'm talking to anybody here tonight. Your mind needs to be renewed. Your mind needs to be transformed. And the carnal mind can't understand the things of God. I wish I could spend more time in 1 Corinthians 2, because that's a good verse to understand how we get understanding, how we get revelation, how we get mind renewal. It is quite clear there that it is by the Spirit of God by the Holy Spirit. And I need you to understand, it's not just by receiving the Holy Spirit. It's by listening to the Holy Spirit on an ongoing basis. The Spirit of God, he says in 1 Corinthians 2, reveals to you what God is thinking. Amen. The mind of God to your spirit. It, it communicates with your inner person the things that please God and the things that displease God. The spirit of God shows you the mind of God. I can see a Christian who's depending on what they were taught only to understand God's mind because they can't extend the principle beyond what they were told. <laughs> they, they will wear the right clothes in the country they're in, but they'll go on vacation and wear other clothes. That's because it's not in their spirit. You understand? They, they operate by a different standard because it's just up here. But the spirit of God will dress you whatever country you're in. And he'll convict you whatever road you step out on when you're not attired the right way. That's the Holy Spirit, not a religion. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we, we have the mind of Christ. We have been shown the mind of Christ by the spirit of the Lord. That's why he says, he that hasn't here, let me hear what? What the spirit saying? The spirit says, it speaks, he speaks to us. And if we don't have him with us, we're not gonna actually have the transformation that we need. The transformation comes from that close relationship with the Lord. That's why I'm fasting. I'm fasting to unblock my ears. I'm fasting to see what opinions need to go. I'm fasting to see what perspective need, needs to go. I'm fasting to see what hobbies need to go, what interests need to go, because you can't always onboard something new until you offboard something old. The Bible says that, that, that you can't put new wine into old bottles. And sometimes God has to change your wine skin. He's got to change the way you think and feel before he can drop some stuff in you, because the stuff he wants to give you will burst you wide open if you're not ready to receive it. That's why we go through fasting, because I'm not ready to receive what God really wants me to have. If I was ready, I'd have it already. So unless you're happy with your current manifestation and how God is working through your life, then you need to go on some fasting for some wineskin transformation. 
because God wants to give you some stuff. I have to accept. I haven't got everything. Otherwise, I'd be further gone. So I'm putting myself through a process another time. I'm putting myself through some hardship again to see what the Lord is going to give me at the point when I am at my flesh weakest, when my flesh can't interrupt and interfere with the agenda of God, where I have no power to resist him based on how much I've submitted myself to him. We have the mind of Christ. How? By the Holy Spirit. Yes, the spirit of God is in the word and the word will transform you. But my Lord, they that are led by the spirit of God, they're the sons of God. You can have the Bible and not know which verse to read today. Which verse to instruct and guide your decision. Oh, that's the spirit of God who gives the breathed word, the rhema word. I need a breathing word. I need a live word. I need a direct word. That's why I'm, I'm dropping stuff off so I can hear God's voice more clearly in my life. I'm telling God, I intend to hear from you. That's why I said to some of you, make a decision about the fasting period that you will do and be accountable to at least one other person. Not to boast, but if you're both on fasting, if you're in the group, if you just want to send it to me, just as a way of getting it out, make a decision and say, this is what I'm going to do. I intend to hear from God. I intend to be with God. God respects the decisions we make the time we take and the places that we create to meet with him. He respects your time and we should respect his. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, he says that you put off concerning the former conversation. That means the old lifestyle. We all had an old lifestyle. That means you, you got to put it off. You got to delete, you got to off board. My phone got to a place recently where I couldn't put on any more new programs. Now I had to make a decision about which ones I'm going to delete. Because there wasn't enough space. Old songwriter says, have you any room for Jesus? Hasten now his word, obey. Room and time now give for Jesus. It says room for pleasure, room for business, but for Christ, the crucified, not a place where he can enter in the heart for which he died. Make room. You have to put some things off. He said, oh, the Lord will take it away from me when he's ready. No, put it off. Put it off concerning the former conversation. There are places you can stop going. There are things you can stop listening to. There are, there are numbers you can delete, put them off. He said, shut the door behind you. You wanna pray, you shut that door. This is not the ark. He's not gonna shut the door for you. That's another example for another time. You need to closet yourself. You need to shut the door. You need to, as it said in Hebrews, lay aside the weights. I believe we know what the weights are, ministry. I believe we know what they are. Whether we call them out, I believe we know most of the time what we need to put aside. We know what's getting in the way of a closer and deeper relationship with God. This is about you. Amen. This is an action that we're intentionally taking towards God seriously. It's not just stopping food. There's much more behind this than just not eating. I am consciously putting stuff aside. Paul said to, I believe it was Timothy, that if a man will purge himself, oh no, but God will purge me. No, if a man will purge himself, you, this is a, a mandatory purging that you are putting yourself through to clear your life, to onboard new information. That's what this is about. I'm not coming out the same. I am emptying myself out, assuming I don't know everything that God has for me. I am putting off deliberately. I am purging myself who are these john arcs that i can't number these are they who came through great tribulations and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb no god washed their robes they wash their robes and make them white no one can repent for you no one can put stuff off for you no one can make you be clean that is a decision i need you to understand this you are not waiting on God to elevate your life. You're not waiting for God to do a deeper work. God is waiting for you to put some things off. He's waiting for you to apply the purgative of his word to your own life. He's waiting for you to shut the door long enough for something to happen in your life. You are not waiting on God. God is waiting on you and he's waiting on me. The old writer said he was there all the time.
just waiting patiently in line, waiting for me to get all the other stuff that I wanted to do first out the way. What a loving God that he would wait. But the time of waiting, the time of his long suffering is coming to an end. This is our time to take all the decisions that we have to take to draw self closer to the Lord. Put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt. Yes, he's corrupt. He didn't love the things of God. He's corrupt. He loved pleasure more than God. He's corrupt. Put him off. Oh, my boy, I can't put my body through that. Put him off. Put off that old man. He don't want to go without food because food fuels him. Give him strength to sin. <laughs> he's corrupt. His lusts are deceitful. He's tricky. He will say he wants one thing, but he really wants something else. He'll hang around at a place to get what he really wants. He's deceitful. Get rid of him. Murder him. That's what Paul said. Mortify the deeds of your body. That's a, that's a murderous activity. You have to kill it. It was always that way in the Old Testament with the sacrifice. Kill it. Bring that animal, put your sin on it, and you kill it. The priest didn't kill it. You had to kill it. You have to kill your own sin in your life. Lay off this flesh which is corrupt. And what? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In the spirit of your mind. God wants a change in your mind. You got to change the way you think about prayer, the way you think about fasting, the way you think about your ministry. The way you think about your life and how God wants to use you, you know, that the mental image of you has to change because many of us have agreed with a satanic description of our life and ministry. Never going to be good enough. Never going to be as good as this one. I'll go here, but I don't think I can. You know, we have all of these. Um, we don't see it, but I call them satanic declarations that we've come into agreement with unwittingly. Agreements that limit the trajectory of the believer, limit how deep we can go in God. Sometimes we are, have thought about the ministers that raised us and the mothers that we came under, and we talk about them as if the move of God in their life couldn't be replicated in your life. Oh, I remember mother so-and-so. I remember this one. I remember that one. I remember how they used to work in the spirit. I remember how they used to move in the spirit. And we don't think that the door of their ministry is waiting for us to walk in it, that there's a mantle there that fell down that nobody picked up when the prophet died. There's a mantle to be picked up and you have to stop seeing yourself as just an observer of church and a partaker of the kingdom of God and an aggressive advancer of the purpose of God in the earth. Stop seeing yourself as just a person in the background. Sometimes that's not what God said. That's what you say. I like to be in the background. Who cares what you like? God wants you out of your area of comfort. That's where we get stretched. That's where we grow. We need the, our minds renewed so we don't accept wrong information about our destiny and our purpose. Now what do you have to do once you put off that old man? Put on the new man. Oh, Christ will just make me new. Yes, he will, but you better take up righteousness. You better take up righteous actions. You can program righteousness into your life. You decide how much money you want to give, whether it's to the poor or to the church. Or to chariot, you make those decisions. Your money is not flying out of your hands without you make decisions about where you invest. And we talked about the three things of fasting. It's private fasting, private praying, and private giving. You want to be really blessed during the fast? Pray when there's no prayer meeting. You want to be really blessed during the fast? Feed somebody else who's hungry. Find a place to put your money to feed someone. You want to be blessed during the fast? then do it privately. Don't announce it to everybody. Keep it within the group because we're doing it together. But you don't have to tell everybody, man, I'm on a 21, I'm on a seven, I'm on this. You lose your blessing. It's not a boastful thing. Do as much privately as you can and you'll see. So that's putting on the new man. Do righteousness. Operate in holiness. This new man is created in righteousness after God and in true holiness. That's a whole new person you're putting on. That's a whole new um, set of behaviors that come with the new man. And just to show you an Old Testament precedent for this, and I'm not going to go much longer. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I hope we know this really well. A new heart also will I give to you. God said, I'm going to onboard a new heart. He said, Nicodemus, don't be surprised that I say unto you, you must be born again. I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of the old operating system. I'm giving you a new one. 
This one's cleaner, faster, upright. Okay? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart from out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. This was the new covenant. This is what the gospel church is all about. It's a change of heart. It's a transformation, right? But this process of transformation is, is an agreement between us and God. As we submit to him voluntarily, he fulfills his promise to us by changing us on the inside. So, so these are the indicators we have in the scriptures for personal, spiritual transformation. You ought not to be saved for years and years and be the same as you were on year one. That means you're not being transformed. That means you're not going on to perfection. That means you're not going from grace to grace. That means your path is not like the just, which gets brighter and brighter. There's something wrong. If you are worse in year 10 than you were in year five, there's some repenting we need to do. And closing on this, as I said earlier, understanding the metaphysics of fasting. Fasting is a tool that God designed for the human body as a way to upgrade your operating system. And you will find people of various religions, they will tell you of the benefits to their body and to their spirit and to their focus just from um, food abstention. Now they mix it with all these other stuff, but we have to understand just like tithing is that they're tapping into a principle that is good for their body. And if you have a healthy body, you can have a healthy mind. I'm not promoting nobody's religion, but I need you to understand the principle. When you understand the principle, you won't just look at this as food denial. You realize that you are turning down an opportunity to develop if you don't fast. Fasting is a way to enhance the likelihood of the successful onboarding of new programs. We can call them spiritual gifts and manifestation of gifts. It might be revelations in the scripture. My God, the things that open up during fasting are marvelous. The things that God will show you, whether it's dreams, visions, or just reading the word and the word just making sense to you. Fasting is, is a powerful tool to onboard the thoughts of God, the gifts of the spirit, the mind of God, and, and the heart of God for the work of the Lord. Fasting helps you delete viruses, corrupt files, and upgrades your processing ability. Some of us are finding it difficult to receive. One scripture says, be careful how you hear. Sometimes we, we're, not, we're not receiving the word right. Think about the parable where the word comes and it's stolen by birds and it falls on stony ground. Fasting breaks up the fallow ground, drives away the birds, fertilizes the earth of your life to receive the word of God in its purest form. The Bible says if the seed doesn't grow in the ground and die, it abides alone. There needs to be a process where that word sits in you. And I want to say in darkness, but I don't want to confuse anybody when I say that. But the seed must be buried in you until something breaks forth in the light of God's presence. you got to take the word that you receive from Bible study, the word that you receive from church. Get it sink down into your spirit and then expose it to the light of God in private prayer, in private worship. And boom. That's what fasting does. It clears the stony ground. It clears all the hindrances and allows the word of God to drop deep enough. Listen out for how you receive the word, like when you're fasting, how you hear God, like when you're fasting. There's nothing like it. That's why God called Moses up to the mountain and then they have no food up there. I did it in the last uh, Bible study. I think maybe I, taught, I preached on it a few Sundays ago. He calls him up to the mountain. He says, I want you to come up here. And then it says six days later, this is... In um, Exodus 25, six days later, God spoke to him from out of the cloud. God didn't talk to Moses for six days. He just left him there with no food. Then he kept him up there for 40. I don't know if he told him, I'm keeping you up here for 40 days, Moses. But when God wants to give you a word, go on some fasting. Empty yourself out so God can onboard what he wants to do in your life. Fasting dissolves doubt and therefore creates the opportunity to amplify faith. Your faith grows because doubt shrinks. Your faith grows in the word as you hear the word. Why? Because faith comes by hearing the word. When you're hearing the word on fasting, your faith just goes through the roof. 
You start to think, my God, I know, I believe you can do anything. I know you can do anything. You said we should lay hands upon the sick. All of a sudden, yeah, yeah give, me, give me someone to lay hands on. I'm ready. <laughs> it just boosts your faith. That's what we need. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's why fasting is important. It allows you to operate in a more pleasing way before the Lord. Fasting helps remove all of the idiosyncrasies of self. So all of our little behaviors, our isms, our miserableness in the morning or our miserableness late at night. All of those ways that we say, I'm not a morning person. Why are you not a morning person? You don't meet Jesus in the morning? What kind of person, a Christian is not a morning person? One said, give me Jesus in the morning. Give me Jesus in the evening. Every minute of the day, let it be Jesus. Stop taking up statements that don't belong to believers. How are you doing? I'm not too bad. Why are you bad at all? Are you not a child of the Most High? Is goodness and mercy not following you all the days of your life? So I got, I got one more slide, but I want us to be encouraged. The reason why God wants us to fast is because it's part of his programming. That's my point tonight. It's part of his programming of the believer. It's a way that he uses to get us to be more like him, not just in the food abstention, but in, in opening our hearts to the word, in listening carefully for his voice, in being in the scriptures and saying, Lord, speak to me. Give me the words that you need me to hear. And finally, I believe this is the end. And I'm not going to maybe teach on this in full, um, but just, as I said, there's more to go in this. There's different programs that God uses. And I've just put this one up here as, a, as an example. Forgetfulness and recollection is a principle. Deleting old files. He says, brethren, I count not myself. Paul in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. I reach and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. These are just principles. Sometimes we have to forget something so we can move forward. Sometimes we're, we're too proud of what we've accomplished that God can't give us anything new to do. We're still bragging about things that happened uh, too many years ago. Forget them. Paul says, if I'm going to really attain what I'm supposed to get, I can't, I can't rest on less, yesterday's successes or even yesterday's failures. I've got to forget them. And I've got to press and push for the things that are ahead. It's one of God's programs. Just forget it. Let it go. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are what? Deleted. <laughs> Deleted. People try to come back to your past. That, that doesn't even live here anymore. That whole file has been deleted. That whole virus is not in my system. Yes, I was an alcoholic. That's not my problem anymore. That, that file is gone. God found a way to delete that from my life. Then we have things that we need to remember. John 16, 21, 33, a woman, when she's in travail, she has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she's delivered of a child, she remembered no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born into the world. These things I've spoken to you that you might have peace. And in the world, you shall have tribulation, just like a woman who has to give birth. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What's coming after is better. So this affects the way I go through trouble. This affects the way I see tribulation. Some people fret and think my life is at an end. I can't make it. Why is this happening to me? Well, there's a program that got on boards that when trouble comes, you remember. Okay, you did say time was going to be hard sometimes. But what's ahead is better. So I can now have joy like Jesus who for the joy, it says in Hebrews 12, that was set before him. He endured the cross and despised the shame. Now set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Because of what was ahead of him, he had a program to deal with struggle. He had a program to deal with when I feel like giving up. In his flesh, he wanted to give up at one point. He says, if this cup may pass from me, then let it pass. But his own spirit kicked in and said, nevertheless, not my will. Thine be done. He had an overriding program that when his flesh was letting him down, his spirit was able to counter it. That's what we need. We need a countering force. That's why we're in fasting. I need the power to counter the things that my flesh would want to bring against me. In the same scripture, it speaks about the chastisement that God gives. My son, in verse 5, 
despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked. So when I get rebuked, I have a program that reminds me I shouldn't faint because the Lord is doing it because he loves me. He scourges every son he receives. And if you endure chastening, then God will deal with you like a son. For what son isn't chastened by his father? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then your bastards are not sons. So when I feel like, man, I'm getting a strong rebuke, that's God saying to you, that's because you're my child. That's because I love you. That's why I'm hurting you with this, this word. That's why I'm sending you this word to expose you. It's not just to make you ashamed. It's to make sure that you repent, that you endure the chastening, that you take it and apply it to your life. That's another program. And the final program, don't think or worry about tomorrow. Take no thought for your life in Matthew 6, 25. What ye shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on it. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? God, as I said earlier on, said don't, don't put energy in that direction. You have a program that tells you don't be materialistic. Don't worry about the basics. I've got it. When that word is onboarded in your life, you stop praying for jobs. Might sound strange. God said, I'm going provi to provide that. You trust him to make the way. Stay busy. Stay busy on the things of God. I'm not saying you shouldn't apply for a job and it won't, and it's going to fall out the sky, but saying, don't worry about these things. Put your energy into an application. Don't put it into worrying. Anxiety takes energy away, and worry takes energy away from something that you could put it towards positively. And my final, final slide, final encouragement. Let's take a fresh approach to the way you look at your life. Don't think of your life as something that's fixed that can never be changed. Even your brain is changing every day. How much more your spirit as you walk into the new things of God. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. There's place to go. There's rooms. There's, there's, there's things we can discover about God. Put your life, I've said here, on the Lord's operating table. This is what this time is about. I, I'm excited about what the Lord can do next. And I don't want to be limited. I don't want to be limited about what the Lord could do through my life. I need to take the limit off in my own mind. Stop restricting my experience, uh, my, what I'm expecting to my previous experiences. I find an experience you haven't had in the word of God. Lord, I want that experience in my life. That's why Paul said, go after the gifts. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Earnestly covet the, the best gifts. Desire to prophesy. Want it. Want it. Go for it. Don't think of your life as a construct that, that is going to be the same forever. No, sir. No, man. Change must happen. Put your life on the Lord's operating table. Only use his word to talk about your circumstances. Don't use your feelings. Don't use just your emotions. Say what the word of God says about you. That's why we need to steep ourselves in it during this fast. I think that's my last point. Only give your energy to the purposes of God, especially during the fast. Don't waste time on television. Don't waste time on entertainments. Cut off the social media. We do this every January now. We just try and put the social media away as much as possible. If it's for work, fine, but we try our best just to, you know, and even the kids take them off of the games, no games. Let's get a focus. Let's give our energy to godly purposes. It's just, a, it's not for the whole year. It's just for a, a part of a month. You'll be surprised at what the Lord will do Embrace change and improvements. Don't be stuck. Don't say, I can never change. I can never do this. I can never do that. Listen for what the purpose of God is and embrace the changes. Lay aside the weights. Bring before him the things you need to get rid of. And the last final two points, be harder on your own body than on other people's. Sometimes we're really tough on others. Be tough on yourself. Yeah, this time is a time to be hard on yourself. Like Paul says, I treat my body hard. It needs to be disciplined. It needs to be disciplined like, a, like, a, like an animal. It needs to be trained. I'm not worried so much about what other people, I'm not going to be watching other people's progress and trying to track them and say, oh, look where they, it's me, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I need this word. I need this transformation. I want to be part of the army in the next season. I don't know what's going to come upon the world. I don't know if God's going to restore all the powers that he did to the, to the early church come the end time. I see Philip 
almost like he's being teleported from one place to the next. I don't know when trouble come, how God's going to uh, use situation and circumstances to deliver me. I see Samson lifting up things with super strength to get out of trouble. I don't know. But I want, whatever God's going to do in the next season, I want to be part of that. He hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. He's going to slay the enemy with the breath of his mouth. I know I'm going to make it. I'm going to be on the right side of this. I don't want to be in the background. One said, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. I want to be right in the middle of it all. Be an overcomer by steeping your life in the word of God. And I can't, I can't emphasize this more. And when I say the word of God, I'm talking about both his written word and his spoken word. I mean, reading that word and also taking the time out to say, Lord, speak to me. What do you want me to come out of this season with? I know what my requests are and I will make them known. But Lord, let your kingdom come and Lord, let your will be done. I might not. I might have programs in my life right now that you want to delete, Lord. I might have ways about me that I was proud of, but you're not proud of them. You might want to change my prayer time. You might want to change my devotion plan. Lord, talk to me. Show me what you want me to do. Bring me to the right information. Lead me to the right resources. I'm yours. I give myself to you. Steep yourself in the word of the Lord. Read it. When we pray, stop and listen and ask him. He said, ask. It shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. That's what we're doing. We're intensifying the search in the time of fasting. We're ratcheting up the intensity by seeking with this mindset. I want to encourage you. The Lord wants to reshape your life. He wants to reprogram you. You don't have to accept all the old stuff. He wants to renew you in the spirit of your mind. Be open to be changed by the Lord. Minister Reed, I know you said earlier on your connection was unstable. If it's any good, then I'll, I'll hand over to you. If it's not, let me just see. I haven't seen all who's on. I don't know if Minister Rowan is here. Praise it's fine, God. sir. Um, You're good. All right, okay for now. I'll hand over to you, sir. Bless the Lord. I will just yeah, bless the Lord. So I just won't turn on my, my video for that sake. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So much, so much food. Um, I've been shared. Um, you know, I think there's something for all of us. Um, there's nothing much I could add um, than to say, let us, you know, meditate on all these things that have been imparted unto us tonight. And um, really, you know, move to that place where we begin to apply the word of God, make the changes and the amendments that we need to make so that we can be aligned to receive of the Lord. Because if we're not aligned in God's word and in his will, then we cannot receive even the promises that are in his word to them that are obedient to his word. Amen. So I just, you know, would encourage us um, to take heed to the word of the Lord um you know the more of the word of god you have inside of you then it's more you give god to work with uh and to stir up within you that you can be led by him because um if you have nothing in you know the word of god is the code it's 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 that it's that program and um, just like with your normal computer it has an operating system and then you have other software that you can you know, add to it to do different programs. It's the same thing. You have to have the word of God in you. Um, and it is that word in you that the Lord will stir up in your heart, give you a revelation about something you read and you had forgotten about it a long time ago. But somehow, especially during the time of fasting, the Lord would bring it back to your remembrance when he wasn't even thinking about it. But if you have no word of God in you, there is nothing to stir up in you. Jesus said, Behold, I, scripture said of Jesus, Behold, I come in the volume of the book. So the volume of the code is already here. And Jesus Christ is that volume. And so the, 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 the more of God's word is in you, in you, then the more the Lord Jesus Christ can speak to you and instruct you and guide you and reveal unto you. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, wonderful teaching that has been imparted and i pray that you will meditate on it you know go back and listen to the recording when it is uploaded make notes if you need to make notes um and and, and begin to practicalize and apply to your hearts god bless you i'm going to pray close us in prayer 
um, as you're in this period of 